and welcome to Season 2, Episode 54 of One Man's Opinion. Yeah, last episode I said next review was going to be the Broadway production of Between Riverside and Crazy, but alas, the reservation was postponed until a later date as one of the actors contracted COVID. Thus, we have what would have been the next review, the off-Broadway revival of Stephen Sondheim's Merrily We Roll Along, directed by Maria Friedman, playing at New York Theatre Workshop, currently running through January 2nd, and will transfer to Broadway this fall. This is wonderful news, as this production of Merrily is overall enjoyable, anchored by three excellent performances in the leading trio of Jonathan Groff, Lindsay Mendez, and Daniel Radcliffe. And really, it's the performances of these three stars and the impressive supporting cast that make the production of Merrily worth seeing. And if box office sales for the off-Broadway run is any indicator, Merrily will have a much more successful than its 1981 original Broadway run of only 16 performances. Now, I get it. Merrily We Roll Along is not everyone's idea of great Sondheim. Its concept is novel, but can be considered contrived, which I respect. As a writing exercise, I appreciate the idea of telling a story in reverse chronological order, starting with the story's end and traveling back in time with each subsequent scene. For me, it mostly works. The story tells the fall and rise of Franklin Shepard, played by Groff, a composer whose lust for success severs the bonds he created with his two former friends, Mary Flynn, played by Mendez, and Charlie Kringus, played by Radcliffe. We start where the story ends, with Frank giving up the last of his ties to his past and ultimately what would be viewed as his integrity for the shallow embrace of the Hollywood elite. We then go back in time to his fallout with his friend and collaborator Charlie, his whirlwind romance with actress Gussie Carnegie, played with resplendent narcissism by Crystal Joy Brown, to the bitter divorce of his first wife Beth Shepard, played with heartbreaking depth by Katie Rose Clark, and so forth. The concept offers a certain emotional inversion since we know what the end result is. This offers opposing emotional responses for the audience. We can focus on the end result, how three friends ended up being severed due to pride and lust, or we can focus on the hope of new beginnings, or it could be both if you want. It'll depend upon you as the audience member how you wish to receive the show's message. For this production, there are strong elements like the cast, there are elements that seem unnecessary like the set design, and parts that are missed opportunities. Let's talk about the set first. Though Sautra Gilmore's scenic design is admirably utilitarian, using a single room design that gets repurposed over and over again, there are items that end up being unnecessary, like the planter boxes on the top of the set. It feels like there should eventually be a scene up there, and it draws the eye toward it for no reason but for it to be unnecessarily decorative. It is plausible they are there to hide something backstage, but without having been back there, it's only speculative. There is also a giant red curtain that drops for Gussie's number at the top of Act 2. I know it's supposed to be a curtain for the new musical Frank and Charlie have written together, but it falls before the song instead of after, which doesn't really work. The curtain sits there for too long, not really serving any purpose aside from setting up the cast for the next scene upstage of it, which isn't even a major issue since the cast is moving and setting up scenes in full view of the house, the rest of the show. This critique, along with the other major one I have with the show, primarily falls on director Friedman, the other critique being the choice to play down Mary's torch she carries for Frank. Don't get me wrong, I think Mendez is wonderful as Mary. She's got Mary's sardonic wit down pat, and it's hysterical, and it is very evident in the first scene that Mary is madly in love with Frank and always has been. The problem is, her continued infatuation with him is only obvious as the script demands, and is otherwise forgotten when it isn't necessary to address. It's a major character element for Mary, and it feels like it was pushed aside. Radcliffe is brilliantly neurotic as Charlie. From the moment he walks on stage in the opening number, Merrily We Roll Along, he gives Charlie this attitude of, I hate Frank, and I don't want to be here in this moment of the story. Red Rogers gives a similar affectation as Joe Josephson, the producer who discovers Frank and Charlie and is also coincidentally the previous husband for Gussie. He also has a I, 
I'm not wanting to be anywhere involved in this scene attitude either with the opening number. While all the other characters are dancing around and smiling and giving hoorays to this being the opening of the show, the two of them give a great beat of this is all fake and if you're buying this then you're a fool and it works. Charlie's neurotic tendencies are only amplified in his next scene as Radcliffe nails his song Franklin Shepherd Inc. It's hysterical. I'll grant that Radcliffe is not the best singer, but what he doesn't have in vocal quality he makes up for in performance. Groff as well gives a great turn. As talented as Frank is, Groff layers the character with a surface confidence over a sensation that Frank is in over his head because he can't control his more impulsive qualities. Of course, Sondheim's music and lyrics help move the story using several leitmotifs for narrative effect. The most impactful being the seven-note theme that is first hinted during Franklin Shepard, Inc., eventually evolving, or devolving, if you will, into opening doors near the end of the show. Merrily We Roll Along is a show that has had to warm up to audiences. I think some of it can be attributed to the latter-day Sondheim mystique, but I've more or less always found the concept at least intriguing and if done right can be fully engaging and entertaining. It does have a few flaws as I pointed out, but the cast's performance keeps it strong enough to be a must see. If not now, since it is more or less sold out, then when it makes its move uptown to Broadway. But I am only one man's opinion, so be sure to leave yours in the comments below. If you want to see Merrily We Roll Along, I'll leave a link in the description where you can get tickets or at least be informed as to how New York Theatre Workshop's cancellation policy works. You can support my channel by liking, sharing, and subscribing. Click the notification bell to be alerted to future reviews. My next review will be the National Tour of Six. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you at the theatre.